Hey everybody, welcome back to Word Balloon, brand new week, John Suntress with you. Couple show notes, questions or comments about the show, reach me via email, john at wordballoon.com. The YouTube channel, I've reached a thousand subscribers, I promise, live video streaming coming. I uh, just have been very busy with radio work after having nothing, all of a sudden I've got tons of hours last week and this week, uh, but things should be settling down uh, in the days reaching Halloween. I've been doing some wor- weird balloon episodes... And I hope you've been enjoying those, a little uh, horror talk and a few other subjects as well. But as always, I thank you very much for listening to the commercials that precede Word Balloon. We've got uh, just one more, and then uh, we'll be getting to the show uh, after one more spot. So as always, I appreciate uh, your patronage and your attention as I try to present some interesting conversation with you at wordballoon.com every week. So uh, one more spot, and we will start. Thanks for listening. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here, two great word balloons for you today. Later on, I'm going to have Brian Michael Bendis on to talk about uh, the big bomb that he just dropped. Superman is abandoning the Clark Kent persona. What does that mean for the future of the DC universe? All word from DC is this is not going to be a temporary thing that they're going to stuff back in six months or a year or whatever. They're sticking with this because they see a lot of story potential for Superman coming out, if you will, and uh, revealing himself. How does the world react? How do villains react? How do heroes react? It's not a uniform, yay! I think there's some people that may be pretty pissed off, frankly. Uh, Readers and members of the DC Universe alike. Well, that's in the other podcast. This podcast that you're listening to now, I'm glad you downloaded it because it's Drew Friedman, a celebration of Drew Friedman, if you will. I'm such a fan of his work. I have been for decades, going back to uh, his time at National Lampoon when he and his brother Josh used to collaborate and do really funny things, outrageous things, things he would absolutely be vilified for today. And we talk about that in these two early interviews with Drew. Now, Drew has a brand new book out called All the Presidents. And it is literally all the portraits of the 45 presidents from Washington to Trump. They look like they belong either on money or on postage stamps. They're beautiful. And I'm a little disappointed because Drew did a video at a Brooklyn bookstore with Robert Klein. It's on YouTube. Great conversation. I reached out to Drew and he's like, you know, that's pretty much the only thing I'm going to do. I am not going to podcast about this. I'll see. You know, he's really good buddies with Gilbert Gottfried and Frank Santo Padre. I have a feeling they, they he still might pop up on there. But it's cool. I don't feel bad. I've had I've had excellent conversations with Drew over the years. A recent one on um, his History of Comics volumes 1 and 2, where we talked a lot about comic book creators. But this covers The Fun Never Stops, a great uh, Fanographics collection of Drew's stuff. We talk a lot about uh, Drew's history as well. And old Jewish comedians. I caught him... I think mid-volume. I want to say I talked to him after the second volume came out. I didn't talk to him about the third volume, but uh, a lot of names you won't remember. But uh, and, and, you know, that goes through the history of the comics talk as well. But great conversations with Drew Friedman, always. And I wanted to uh, celebrate him and his release of All the Presidents from Fanagraphics, which is out now. But uh, reach back and just talk to him about how his art style has changed and some of the great celebrities enc- encounters that he had over the years. Uh, his dad, Bruce J. Friedman, uh, an accomplished writer himself, uh, he wrote Splash, the Tom Hanks, uh, John Candy movie, with, uh, what's her name? And now I'm blanking. Shame on me. You know what I'm talking about, the uh, beautiful blonde woman. Shame on me. I cannot think of her name. All right, everyone's shouting it out to me right now. Uh, but uh, also, uh, he wrote st- uh, the adaptation of Kurt Vonnegut's Steam Bath uh, for public television, where we saw Valerie Perrine uh, naked. Pretty cool stuff in the 70s. Bill Bixby in that wonderful adaptation of the uh, Kurt Vonnegut story. Um, So his dad was an accomplished writer, and I think that's how he got to meet a lot of celebrities when he was younger. He also got to visit Marvel Comics because uh, Bruce Friedman was doing some writing on their uh, magazine end, the pulp end, not the comics end. But uh, pretty neat stuff, man, and I really enjoyed my conversations with Drew. Uh, There is a a new uh, documentary about Drew that is in the works, very close to completion, can't wait for that to come out, and uh, hopefully we'll get uh, Drew in the near future on a different project. But now a celebration of Drew Friedman on today's Word Balloon. All brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners. Thank you greatly, League, for your support via Patreon. You're keeping the lights on. I keep saying it, and I mean it. Uh, you don't have to subscribe to Word Balloon. It's free, 
But uh, if you are able to swing it, is Word Balloon worth uh, the price of a comic book a month to you? Is it worth a dollar a month to you? I try to give you interesting, unique uh, conversations that you won't find on any other podcasts. And I'm uh, pleased with uh, the, the creators that are always willing to come back and share their stories. You can sponsor Word Balloon via Patreon by going to patreon.com slash Word Balloon or click on the front page ad of Patreon and uh, at wordballoon.com and that will take you to my Patreon page as well. Thank you greatly for your support, League of Word Balloon listeners. Word Balloon is also brought to you by Aftershock Comics. You know, they're having another great year. They called uh, 2019 the year of reading dangerously and I can appreciate that because they continue to put out amazing books. Things like Joe Pruitt's horror anthology Shock which I hope to talk to him about before the Halloween season ends, and it could be another great weird balloon. Um, But also uh, great stuff from Marguerite Bennett, Animosity, and Jimmy's Bastards from Garth Ennis, and A Walk Through Hell. You got uh, Adam Glass and uh, Aiden Glass also uh, doing The Lollipop Gang. Uh, You know, uh, Descendant from Stephanie Phillips. So many great books. Stronghold from Phil Hester. Cullen Bunn stuff like Brothers Direct Cool and Dark Ark and Night Temporal and my buddy Tim Seeley with Dark Red. Great books, great genre-bending books, and great writers and artists at Aftershock Comics. Now, you don't have to take my word for it. Go to their website. You'll find full story descriptions, preview pages, and the diamond codes on how to order these books through your local shop at AftershockComics.com. All right, let's get into it, man. Let's step back uh, to the, the early days of Word Balloon and these two great conversations with Drew Friedman talking about his wonderful satirical art and uh, some of the great subjects that he covers in it. Uh, here's the first conversation now on Word Balloon. Drew Friedman's photorealistic style has been seen in such diverse magazines as Art Spiegelman's Raw and Mad Magazine, The New Yorker, Entertainment Weekly, and High Times. He and his brother Josh created many parodies of the black and white celebrity images he saw on the Million Dollar Movie and Chiller Theater TV shows of the 1960s. Old Jewish Comedians is the first new collection of Drew's art in almost 10 years. Where did your style come from? It sort of evolved, I guess, naturally, but I always drew, no pun intended, but when I was younger, I used to draw similar to Basil Wilmerton, and I was heavily influenced by Mad Magazine and a lot of those guys, so I used to draw, like, insane faces in a Basil Wilmerton style, just exaggerated. I used to draw my teachers, you know, on on, I got in in trouble when I was a kid, or even into high school, drawing my teachers on desks and stuff, but... But I used to draw really fast, and I wanted to um, slow down a little bit, so I just sort of naturally started doing that stipple style, and it really slowed me down. It made me concentrate a lot more on drawing, rather than just turning things out real quickly. I wanted to just slow down, and I wasn't really a fan of the stipple style. I can't name any artists that I admire who did that, but it sort of it just sort of suited what I wanted to do, and also I wanted those early strips to look kind of photographic, like Mm -hmm. as if they were really happening or it could have happened. You know, I wanted to give them that documentary style. Were magazines like Look and Life then obviously inspirational as well in terms of photographs? Yeah, sure. You know, we had, I grew up with, my parents subscribed to lots and lots of magazines, so we'd look at stuff every week. Plus, my father worked in in the magazine business, so he would bring, bring home lots of magazines as well as Marvel Comics because he worked at the company called um, magazine management, which is the company that owned own Marvel Comics. So the guy who was in the next office from him was Stan Lee. Oh, so wow. He would bring us home piles of Marvel Comics every week, <laughs> and as well, as well as Mad Magazine, the famous monsters. So that stuff was just always around. How many of the uh, old Mad Magazine guys were you able to uh, get to know? I've gotten to know a few of them recently because I've been contributing to Mad for the last 15 years, which means I've been an official idiot for the last 15 years. <laughs> But I've gotten to know a few of them, and they're all, you know, all the old-timers are great guys. Al Jaffe and Mort Rucker I've met, and Sergio Argonis. And most of them that are still around I've either met or talked to. I talked to Don, Don Martin once. I never met him. He died a few years ago. But, yeah. Um, but, I, you know, Matt has a Christmas party every year. So I've, I've gone to a few of those, and I've gotten to meet some of those guys there. And they're all sweet, you know, great guys. It's great because a lot of your subjects really, you know, it, it speaks to a specific era uh, that I, I think, you know, the, the boomers can certainly appreciate as kids. And, you know, you're, you're one of us. You're, you're one of those guys, obviously, just watching the parade of celebrity. Where, where did the twist come from? I mean, was it just, you know, your own, you and, you and Josh kind of, like, 
going in a weird direction, or was it just, um, I don't know if you can even maybe articulate where... I guess that's, that's what it would be, going in a, in a weird direction, but, you know, we weren't into paying tribute to these guys, really, and also we were more interested in the obscure people yeah. that, you know, most people didn't pay much attention to or, or forgotten, Hollywood types or TV types, so to do tributes or to do life stories on Joe Franklin or some of the like lesser celebrities like Wayne Newton and Joey Heatherton was just our particular take on celebrity celebrities and you know the world of celebrity and I would never have been interested in doing like tributes to you know big big famous movie stars or anything I was we were always more you know we were doing the comics more interested in the uh, more obscure and you know the forgotten and at the time we were not really aiming the stuff towards large audiences some of the stuff was appearing in National Lampoon but a lot of it was just appearing in publications with less circulation, like Robert Crumb's magazine Weirdo and Art Spiegelman's Raw and things like that. So we were gaming the stuff towards just amusing our friends at the beginning anyway, just like amusing our friends with these comics and not really thinking about like large audiences. You know, it wasn't really till the, the first anthology was published in 86 that the stuff like reached a, a larger audience anyway, I think. And uh, then with Heavy Metal and Lampoon also. Did you just submit things to, to Crum and, and Spiegelman for, for, for their magazines? Or? Spiegelman was a teacher of, at School of Visual Arts in the early 80s. He was an instructor there. So I was in his class along with some other cartoonists. We're in the first issue of Raw. When Spiegelman started Raw, he invited a couple of his students to, to do work for it. And I was one of them. And also a guy named Kaz and Mark Newgarden, some of it some other cartoonists who are still around today and doing interesting work. So that, that was, like, fortunate because he was just starting it then. And then out of the blue, I just sent stuff to Robert Crumb when he started his magazine, and I had no idea whether he was going to like my stuff or not. And he sent me back a, a letter. He didn't want to run the piece I sent, but he said he'd been following my stuff and really enjoyed it, and then he invited me to contribute something to Weirdo, so I did, and then I wound up doing a lot of stuff for him. <laughs> Do you remember some of those early Raw pieces? What what the first piece was? The maybe first that... piece in Raw was was the Andy Griffith show parody of the um, Andy Griffith TV show, <laughs> and it was a uh, about a black man coming to Mayberry, you know, just driving through Mayberry <laughs> and what happened. So that was I actually didn't do it for Roy. It was done before Roy it was done. It originally appeared in Harvey Kurtzman's school publication. Harvey Kurtzman was also an instructor at School of Visual Arts at that time, and so was Will Eisner. So that was done for Harvey Kurtzman's publication, and then it wound up in Art Spiegelman's room. Spiegelman saw it and liked it and ran it in the first issue of Raw. So that was the first thing in there. Well, I'm wondering if I either saw it in then your first collection or yeah, if it's I... In, or... it's in there as well. It's in the first collection. Okay. Because I was going to say either that or I didn't know if it, it was also in Lampoon ever. I don't think it was in Lampoon. It was actually in High Times okay. magazine in the <laughs> early 80s, and then it was in the first book collection. Um Persons with any similarity to persons living or dead is pure, purely coincidental. It's the book that had Shemp on the cover. Yes, and 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 you know, and I, I want to get into old Jewish com comedians because, like Shemp, I know Tor Johnson is one of your guys, and certainly I think if there's a poster child among your your subjects, it, it might be Tor Johnson. But I've always loved your Shemp Howard in particular because. Uh, just the and the great thing about your art in general, you really get into the, the the craters that these poor guys had on their faces. Yeah, well, yeah, uh, <laughs> not not drawing that stuff to make fun of them in any way, but just trying to make them look, you know, present them as they looked. Sure, you know, in all their glory. And, you know, <laughs> Shemp, Shemp was, you know, he wasn't. Um, he had no problem with the way he looked. In fact, he used to advertise himself as the ugliest man in Hollywood. He was like proud of that fact. And, he had a good sense of humor, um, and Tor Johnson to me was seemed just like a natural to be turned into a comic strip character because he looked he looked like well he was another guy in the tradition of Don D and Daddy Warbucks because he had white eyes you know when he was in movies usually they give him the white eyeballs so I just thought he you know <laughs> he he was part of that tradition so and yeah, he was another guy I, I grew up loving seeing him in movies and on Chiller Theater in New York and sure. things like that so. Um, it's, uh, the first piece I did with him was just him at home in um, the late 60s or when he was sort of out of work and like just what his day would be. <laughs> I remember that, was, that appeared, I think that was the first thing I did for Robert Crumb's magazine. Oh, wow. 
Because yeah, I, and, I, had, and, and when Crum accepted it, he said, "I love it," but I, I never heard of this guy Tor Johnson. So <laughs> I had to sort of fill him in on it. You know, like, well, he was a wrestler who became a movie actor. You know, and then he actually wound up selling Christmas trees in the late sixties. Oh my God! Wow. Yeah, and that's the other thing. Really, not a lot of happy endings in a lot of your guys' subjects. And I guess not. But you know, yeah, yeah. The, a lot of these guys, like you know, they were in movies and they had careers in show business. But you know, they it didn't all wind up so great. Which is the in the Jewish comedian book, which is the current book. I sort of some of the drawings sort of present little stories. There's no there's no text in the book aside from their real name, their real Jewish name, and mm-hmm. then their their show business name. So it's Jerome Levitch becomes Jerry Lewis like that but some of the some of the drawing drawings are little stories like the jack benny i show him like at the height of his at the height of his fame he's an old man but he's sitting in his beverly hills mansion just looking so content like he's done it all and then i have a guy named mousy garner who's wrapped up in a electric electric blanket looking at the reader like what happened i've been in show business for you know 80 90 years and this is where i wind up so it's kind of poignant i guess but you know, it's like sort of a, the, the the extreme. You know, the showing those are the two extreme ones in the book: the Jack Benny and the Mousy Garner. Yeah, and Mousy is a guy that I had heard about because for a while there was a talk that he kind of in, injected himself into the Three Stooges story that maybe he was going to be a guy that would replace uh, Joe Dorita. Well, that was always his career, even from the thirties. It was he was going to be one of the Three Stooges, but he never actually became a Stooge. <laughs> sort of became a sort of pseudo stooge or when ted healy when the three stooges left ted healy in the mid in the early 30s to go to columbia pictures to do their own shorts ted healy needed he was there he was their straight man so he needed some new stooges to, to smack around so mm-hmm. he hired these three guys mousy garner was one of them and he, he they were in some of his they were in movies with him a little bit but and then later on you know when joe when joe besser um left the Three Stooges when Shemp died. Like, they considered hiring Mousy, but he just never, you know, he never got the gig. Yeah. He, he did wind up in the Spike Jones band for a while, although he couldn't play an instrument, which is weird. But he had a funny face, so that was good enough. <laughs> and he only died recently, only, only, just a couple of years ago, I think. And I think he lived into his 90s, and sort of like one of these guys, like, you know, he was just always around. And like, every everybody I know in... You know, the friends I have in Hollywood up all, all encountered Nazi Garner, you know, one place or another. So, but this is my that's my little tribute to Nazi. Were did you meet any of these guys? Um, um, yeah, well, actually, when this book came out, the weird thing that happened, which I wasn't anticipating, was a lot of these, com- a lot of the comedians in the book, the living ones, most of them are deceased, but the living right. ones have embraced the book, um, including a guy named Mickey Freeman who was a regular on the Bilko show Phil Silver show and Freddie Roman and, and Jerry Lewis they have all they all called and told me how much they love the book and then the Friars threw a book party for it that's in, cool in November hosted by Freddie Roman and Mickey Freeman and that was that was great it's surreal in a, in a way but, <laughs> but it was great and it was very gratifying to note that these guys you know embraced the book and, and you know some of them some of the other comedians are, you know Jack Carter is, is in the book, and he's a bit of a, he's always been a curmudgeon, that's part of his shtick. I didn't know he was still alive. He's still alive, he's probably in his 80s, he lives in Los Angeles, but the Los Angeles Times did a piece about the book, so they contacted some of the comics, and they talked to Jerry Lewis, and Mickey Freeman and Freddie, and he also talked to Jack Carter, who said he was not so thrilled to be in the book, because I, I didn't. I, I made I, I, it didn't look like him according to him it's like I made him look he said what are those freckles on my head and the hair is all wrong and that stupid grin he gave me but then he praised the other drawings he said I nailed Buddy Hackett and Milton Berle and all that so yeah but so that Carter wasn't so thrilled but that's that's what I would have expected anyway so. that was a great Vegas look at Hackett it, it's really cool and, thank uh, you and, and I uh, you know you, you mentioned the Friars Club is it me and maybe because of our generation but you see the roast today on Comedy Central, and it's such a pale comparison to the sneaked out tapes that we got of the old roasts and things like that that still exist. And it seemed, and I, I don't know, you tell me, you've been there. Does it still, you know, seem like the Friars, Friars Club when you're up close, or 
you know, is, is something missing now that the generations have passed in. The Friars Club itself is, you know, is, is a men's club, or like it's open to women now too. But that's a, it's a beautiful building in Manhattan. So this thing, this party they gave was, it was called a uh, book warming. Okay. They do it for like, you know, for books, for like, uh, when members have books come out, they throw these book warmings. But I'm not a member of the Friars, but they put this party together anyway. I did go to the Jerry Lewis roast last year. And you know they there's so many people go to these things that they have to ha- they don't even have them at the Friars Club anymore. They had this at the New York Hilton. Sure. So there were like th- probably a couple of thousand people there, and then the dais itself there were over a hundred people. Like you know, it was like a, it was like a football field. Sure. And Jerry and unfortunately Jerry wasn't in good shape that day. He was like very sick, and he, he looked sick, and then he he actually had a stroke right after the roast, and he, he went he went home, and you know he shouldn't have done it, but. The roast itself was incredible because there were some there were old timers like roasting him, and then some of the new some some new comics who I think are very funny like Jeffrey Ross and Lisa Lampanelli and Gilbert Gottfried who was just outrageous like that. But um, I can't really compare it to the old days because I never really re- attended any of the old ones. I've, I've heard I've heard some of the clips and I've heard about you know some of the legendary um, things that happened at some of the old uh, roasts in the mm-hmm. old days, but. I enjoy, I enjoy some of the roasts, and I've seen a few of them. I'd love to see the Chevy Chase one, because I heard that was, like, over the top. <laughs> I, I don't know if there's a, a tape that exists of it, but, they, you know, they really tore into him. Yeah, there, were, there, <laughs> there really wasn't many I friendly... Think he, I think he was shell-shocked at the end. That's what I heard, anyway. <laughs> he was, like, just, uh, you know, he, he didn't expect what they did to him. <laughs> Absolutely. A couple of the comics, because, as you say, there are some very obscure ones in there, and I thought I knew my old... Borscht Belt comics. Well, I know who you're going to say because everybody says who is Menasha Skolnick. Thank you. Um, he was. I, I have to admit, I had never heard of him either when I started the book. But I found a photo of him in a, in a old player's guide, which is a book that lists like old actors, and I have one from the late '50s. And sure enough, his face was in there with a few of his credits. So I googled him and got information, and then I asked around about him, and it turns out he was a legendary um, Yiddish. Uh, co- comedian on stage in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. He, he wound up doing television, some television, on Ed Sullivan and stuff. And then he was actually starred in a couple of Broadway shows, even into the late 60s. And I think he died around 1970. But I, I, I love putting him, him in there because he was the one guy who didn't change his name. Because um, I have, you know, like I said, the the real name and the show business name. Sure. So show business name so I have Nasha Skolnick and then Nasha Skolnick is the show is the uh, show business so <laughs> that was like a little like um, you know just, I thought that was funny but he's the one guy nobody under say under 50 has ever heard of him but every time I'm, any, any old timer says oh of course Manasha Skolnick he was hilarious and my aunt was, was like a big Manasha Skolnick fan and my father knew all about him and stuff so you know who knew but He's the one guy like nobody. No, nobody has any clue. You know. and a couple other guys too, but he is Manasha Skolnick is the most obscure. I think. Is is Lou Jacoby in the book? No, because some of these guys, I, I think of him more as an actor. There's okay. a few actors in the book, like Al Lewis is an actor, but always comics. Lou Jacoby was like the dramatic work. He sure. Was, it, it's possible. I'm doing a sequel. The sequel will be out next week. More old Jewish comedians. Oh, that's great. And the difference is going to be there's going to be some women this time. Because a couple of people say, how come there's no women? And they say, well, there weren't that many stand-up comics. Like, Phyllis Diller was sort of the first. You know, there were a lot of, like, M- Molly Pecan and Gertrude Berg and Fanny Bryce. You know, sure. There were a lot of Jewish, um, Jewish uh, female comic actresses. Stuff, but there weren't that many official Jewish comics. Phyllis Diller was, and she was Jewish. And don't get the, don't get the. I'm not really into the Jewish thing. I just like <laughs> thought about what book I want to do, and I was, I thought I want to draw old comedians, but you know, so many of them are Jewish. Absolutely. You know, I can think of a few that weren't. You know, some great ones like Bob Hope and Jackie Gleason, W. C. Fields and Buster Keith. There's like a list, but. So many of them, you know, when I go down a list, so many of my favorites growing up happen to be Jewish. So these are like comedians who happen to be Jewish. There's like a lot of them didn't like play play up their Jewishness. Right. And even Jack Carter, when the reporter from the Los Angeles Times called him and mentioned what the book was called, Jack Carter goes, first of all, I don't like the word old, and I don't like the word Jewish. I never worked Jewish. So... <laughs> 
I didn't know Bud Abbott was Jewish. A, lot, a few people have said that his mother was Jewish, his father wasn't, but he conver- and he converted to to Judaism. Well, he was Jewish, but he, his wife actually wasn't Jewish, and she they they had a, um, a ceremony in the late forties where she converted to Judaism. And I always felt bad for him because he, uh, you know, at the end was doing the Abbott and Costello cartoon. I know when I was a little kid. Yeah, well, he was doing the voice for that. Yeah, the guy named Candy Candido doing the voice of Lou Costello, and it was like you know. I loved seeing them when I was a kid, but like in retrospect, most of them were like, hey, oh, look, there's a monster from outer space. you got to go fight it. <laughs> it was like basically the same plot over and over. Yeah, pretty much just taken from the comic book or vice versa. Yeah, yeah. It was kind of pathetic, but it you know, kept him a little busy as, towards the end of his life. Sure. And, and Benny, I'm really glad Benny Rubin is in the book because I, I've always been a fan of Benny Rubin's. I always think he like, you know, made his presence known in those like little two-minute moments in mm-hmm. the Stooges or a That Girl episode or wherever the hell the guy was. Yep, yep. There's a few guys like that, like uh, I'm going in the next book, a guy named Herbie Fay, who was like a face that everybody knows. Most people don't know his name. He was also a regular on Bilko, but he was a bald, he was a bald guy. He he was on Bilko, but he looked like he was in his 60s, even though he was, you know, in the platoon and everything. But he he always was the guy who played like the either the, the uh, Jewish the Jewish waiter or the uh, the tailor. It's like you'll know his face when you see him. Okay. There's a few guys like that, but I didn't want to leave Benny Rubin out of the first book. There were a couple of guys I just thought had to be in, you know, when you think of Jewish comedians, like Kenny Youngman has to be there. Sure. And Milton Berle, who I did on the cover. Yes, wonderful and Benny picture. Benny Rubin and a few more obscure ones, and of course, Jerry Lewis. But there's a long list of people I can choose from for the second book, like, that weren't included in the first, including Eddie Cantor and Jan Murray, who I wanted to include, but I didn't have any good reference for him at the time. And, and he since died. But he'll be in the second book. That's cool. And Zero Mustel, and you know, and then again, like I said, some women like uh, Molly Pecan, definitely, and um, Phyllis Stiller, and um, uh, also a woman named um, uh, actually I forget her name now. She's so unknown. Uh, Bobby Baker, who was the queen of the cruise ship. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> she was um, in, uh, a Catskill comedian for, for years and years, and then she got became the queen of the cruise ship. So she'll be in the book. Did your family go to any of the old Catskill uh, resorts and everything back no, then? No, we didn't really do that. I went when I was a teenager uh, to Kutcher's Country Club, which is the, little, the last one that's actually still there and where they still have shows and stuff. But no, we didn't really do that. We didn't do much of that. And um, are you and Josh going to do anything together? It seems unlikely. He, he does his own thing. He's a musician, and he has his own book projects. And, you know, mm-hmm. we, we sort of like... Um, we we did, I think we did what we wanted to do together, and then we sort of like went off in different directions. That's cool. Do you see yourself um, pairing up with another writer to do more sequential stuff? I, I like the portraits, and the portraits, as you say, do tell a lot because there there really is a story in each of these. As in Mousy Gardner's, I think a great example. Yeah. But and, and it's funny because uh, I guess Leonard Maltin does the forward, but beyond that, there really are no other words other than, as you say, everyone's names. Well, I actually thought about including some text and some history of each person, but I just didn't want this to be a uh, history book, because those already exist. There's already books about Jewish comedians. You can get a lot of information on the web. I wanted this to be something, you know, where the, 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 the story is in the faces, uh, you know. And so I debated whether I should, there should be some text, but then I just decided, no, I don't want it. you know. It, I, th- I thought it would cheapen the work a little to have. And also, I'm not... You know, I have to admit, I'm not a fan of some of these guys in the book. I'm not even a fan of their, their, <laughs> their work necessarily, but, you know, they all have the, the same thing in common, which is they have these great faces, and they all, like, even when they're old, still wanted to be funny and have, you know, the, the spot. I mean, they just, I have them like, uh, it's a sort of in-your-face effect, hopefully, where they're, you know, the faces are, are, like, looking right at you, and Absolutely. they just, like, are still begging, you know, begging for you to laugh at them, you know, even though they're they're old and their the days are numbered, they still want to, you know, they still want to be in the spotlight. They don't want to give up. So that's hopefully the effect. But as far as comics, this next anthology that's coming out in a couple of months, the fun never stops. We'll have a lot of. It's about half comics. It's like comics that I've done since the last book um, of comics called Warts and All that came out in '91. So this is like all the all the comics I've done since that. Either with a, with collaborators with collaborators or by myself or my main writing partner is my wife Kathy and we like work out um, ideas and situations together and, and dialogue. So, um, but all that work will be in this next book, 
including a, a piece that just ran a few weeks ago, which I think you can see on the web called Guilty Pleasures of Lit Literary Greats, which is um, about like uh, famous writers and their like, guilty pleasures. So I'll just mention the first panel is William Faulkner. Um, <laughs> the text says, in the early 60s, William Faulkner would, 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 without fail, excuse himself from his dinner guests to enjoy his favorite TV sitcom, Car 54, Where Are You? A friend of mine had just read a Faulkner biography, which was about 800 pages. So, like, on page 700-something, he said, he said, like, the, the, the book was, like, you know, oppressively plotting and boring, but all of a sudden, on page 700-something, there's a thing, we're, we're basically describing that, where how Faulkner would excuse himself on Saturday night, that wherever he was, to watch Car 54, Where Are You? So... That's the first panel of this strip. William Faulkner watching Joey Roth you know, <laughs> do the ooh ooh, and, and Faulkner just like you know laughing. So yes. that's, that's the first piece. But that'll be in this next book. And that was the last comic I did. Yeah, the uh, J.D. Salinger Elaine Joyce uh, connection really. Uh, <laughs> that was something I hadn't heard before. Yeah, I'd heard that one for years, but then of course since I did this, other people were saying, "Well, what about Salinger um, being obsessed with the actress Cap?" Catherine Oxenberg from Dynasty, and, and and Peter Bag actually emailed me and said, um, "Well, I had already heard this, but he, he mentioned and it, they printed his letter in the New York Observer that he that fuck that um, Salinger actually flew out to Hollywood to, to get onto the set of Dynasty to meet Catherine Oxenberg. He was so um, obsessed with her, and she didn't know who he was and had him escorted off the set. You know, she was like uh, creeped out by the old man." <laughs> And then the other, the last one that you know really does tie into comics was Vladimir Nabokov was obsessed with Dennis the Menace because he thought that uh, that why he was always wondered why Dennis didn't look like either one of his parents, so he must be illegitimate. <laughs> or he looked like his mother, but he didn't look like his father, so he must have been Ill illegitimate. You know? Mr. Wilson, obviously. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. No, that's great. And um, I, it's funny. I just got uh, an evening with Groucho. And uh, didn't know about the T.S. Eliot Groucho connection until uh, hearing that, and then I saw your strip, and I'm like, "Oh, that's cool." We'd always heard they were they were pen pals, and then they they finally met, and then somebody just told me, you know, who's just like you know obsessed with this kind of stuff. Yeah, like Groucho just wanted to like uh, talk about King Lear. T.S. Eliot was a huge Marx Brothers fan. He wanted to talk, meet Groucho Marx, and you know, I suppose talk about the Marx Brothers, or you know, just be amused by Groucho. And Groucho wanted to just discuss King Lear, so I have T.S. Eliot sort of dozing off as Grouch was like, you know, you know. <laughs> In the first part of the... Yeah. <laughs> ...of the story. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I thought that was a, a little amusing moment. May I ask quickly about uh, just uh, Joe Franklin, the incredible, sh the amazing shrinking Joe Franklin. Uh, that was always one of my favorites, along with the, uh, the Andy of Mayberry uh, sequence you guys did. It's, you know, are there... It's, it seems to me that, and as you said, in terms of guys like Jack Carter not being happy with old, old Jewish comedians, are there, are there Tor Johnsons today, in today's world of celebrity, that, like, interest you in that, in that same way? I kind of doubt it. I, you know, maybe I could think of a few, but no, I don't think, it, it, you know, it's like I, uh, I grew up with, with Tor Johnson and, and a lot of the guys that we, that we did in the early strips, so... Um, sort of like, like been there and done it, and the, the newer work is um, not really uh, it doesn't really um, go in that direction. Maybe the Jewish comedian book fits into that category, where it's like you know reviving some of these guys who either people never heard of before, or you know, or maybe heard of when they were kids or years ago, but haven't thought of for a long time. So it almost seems like the hype machine. Of today's celebrity really you know, doesn't allow for obscurity. I mean, look like you know that guy William Hung from American Idol is, I think, a fair Tor Johnson kind of comparison, and it's like too late. I mean, my God, the guy's on extra every other week. And yeah, I guess so. I don't really you know follow it too much, like what's going on. You know, I, I do a lot of illustration for magazines, and sometimes I'm asked to draw uh, current celebrities, and it's it's usually best for me not to even know who they are, or else you know I would turn the assignment down. So. So many. Uh, unfortunately, I was at when I I used to do a lot of work for Entertainment Weekly, and and they would always inevitably ask me to draw the Friends, the cast of the Friends. <laughs> you know, 
Okay. I never, I never saw the show. To this day, I still haven't seen it, and I, I purposely didn't watch it because I know if I ever watched it once, I would, I would say, you know, no, I can't do that assignment because I know I would hate it. <laughs> so I, you know, so I, I, I've, done, I've drawn the friends many times. I even know their names, like you know the characters' names, but I've never seen the show, and hopefully, I never will. <laughs> what makes you laugh these days? I mean, are there are there new comedians out there and things that are, um, yeah, or writers and you know. Um, I, I guess you know just what everybody else enjoys. Uh, I, I thought Borat, Borat was great. I cool. loved that. And um, and Little Miss Sunshine. You know, nothing sure. that obscure. You know, what what just about what everybody else likes. You know, I'm not that picky. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, yeah, I did. I I loved the, I loved Borat. I didn't I didn't know if I would or not because it was so like you know people were raving about it so much. I was sort of resistant to it, but I did. I loved it. You know. The sequel to Old Jewish Comedians is coming out in a couple months. That'll be out uh, about a year from now, actually. Oh, okay. I'm still working on that. It'll be out early next year from Fantagraphics um, with an introduction by Larry Gelbart, who was a writer who he worked with a lot of the people who were, who were in the first book and who are going to be in the second book. And he also um, he worked with them and he also knew a lot of the people. Like he was a writer on the Sid Caesar show mm-hmm. and he was a writer for, for Bob Hope for years and for Jackie Gleason. And, and then he worked with Zero Mostello on Broadway. Zero Mostello will be in the book. And, cool. and Jack Gilford and he worked with Woody Allen. So he's writing the forward to the, to the sequel. And then the, the book that's coming out in a couple of months, The Fun Never Stops, which is an anthology, also from Fantagraphics. And Dan Close did the introduction to that. And, um, and it, it also is going to have a piece that ran in Comic Art Magazine, um, the last issue, which is um, sort of about my work um, like the first 20, 55 years of, of my work, you know, of like you know, where I've been and, and you know what I'm doing now and stuff. So, and it'll have a lot of photographs and stuff. That's great. You know, when that comes out, I'd, I'd love to speak to you again if, if we could. Uh, That'd be great. And I'm actually going to do, you know, I mean, go to comic conventions to, to promote the book. So. You know, oh, wonderful. Well, I hope uh, you come to Chicago. I'm, I'm hoping to be in San Diego and New York uh, for the next couple. I wasn't at this past New York convention, but... Uh, no, I, I heard that. I heard it's such a crush of humanity at that New York one. <laughs> like uh, I, I, re- I talked to a few people who were there, and I was invited to go, and I declined because um, Topps Bubblegum has a booth. I'm doing the work for Topps right now, a new series they're doing. But um, they wanted me to come and help you know, promote it or whatever. Sure. But I had heard that like last year they were turning people away. It was so crowded. I was there last year, yes. Yeah, so I didn't go this year. But uh, I'll, I'll, you know, I'm gonna, when this book, next book comes out, I'm going to go to some of those conventions. You know, I'd love to go to Chicago because I keep hearing this store called Quimby. Quimby's is incredible. You'd love Quimby's, absolutely. Yeah, yeah there's, and there's several there. there's several stores like that 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 would carry your stuff. And yeah, I talked to Monty Beauchamp, who edited the Jewish Comedian books, edits Blab magazine. He lives in Chicago, and he's always you know saying, "I would love Quimby's." I, I know I would. That's cool. What's uh, can you tell us quickly about the Tops uh, project, or you want to wait until it's? Uh... I, I think I should wait. I'm not sure they want to. It involves. Maybe I should hold off for okay. now. I'm not sure they really want it to get out quite yet. Drew Friedman, thank you very much for your time. I'm a, I am, I'm a longtime fan, and, and really, you, you, you draw very funny stuff. Thanks, John. I really appreciate the, it. The people who know your subjects know uh, that you capture them and always give them a great spin. So, so thank you, and uh, looking forward to talking to you again. Thanks so much. So there you go. That was my first conversation with Drew Friedman. Wow. Uh, a long, long time ago, within the first hundred episodes of Word Balloon, I've got it posted as episode... 49, but there are uh, many 2005 episodes that haven't made it to the current Word Balloon uh, feed. So, you know, you can still call it episode 49, but I know that it might have been closer, nearer to 100 than that. Regardless, uh, let me give you my second conversation with Drew. This was about the collection called The Fun Never Stops. And uh, my first question is, because he is a really goofy looking guy on the cover, and I wondered if that was somebody from his past or whatever, and that's uh, that initial cu- uh, question as I give you part two of Drew Friedman here on Word Balloon. Who's on the cover? He's nobody. He's just a guy having fun in, in a, um, an old folks home. He's got a toupee on and, you know, he's just having a great time and the people behind him look a little miserable but, you know, they got their party hats on too and there's one guy on the ground that you can see you know, he didn't quite make it through the party so it just, you know, goes with the title The Fun Never Stops. The miscellaneous people that you do that aren't famous, you know, are you just scanning faces as you see them? Are you going through old um, yearbooks or anything in terms yeah, of... Yeah, I have a, a collection of old yearbooks, but I also clip photos from the the, the daily newspapers I get, mm-hmm. the local newspapers. 
and from magazines and, and just any interesting kind of face that I might happen to see, I always clip. And, and then actually people send me photos. My younger brother, Kip, who lives in Wisconsin, is a professional photographer. He'll actually, he photographs weddings and bar mitzvahs, and he'll send me random photos, you know, occasionally. People sort of know what I like and what I can use. And then, you know, I try to enhance things or, you know, tone things down sometimes or, or you know, play things up. So the worst kind of reference... So that, that I get when I have an assi- when I get an assignment is just a blank, like celebrity stare, like staring at the camera, you know, with a blank smile on. It's like the worst thing I can get. Who are some of the celebrities that were kind of tough for you to really bring out your style in in presenting them? It's usually attractive people, you know, attractive women. Not that I have anything against you know drawing attractive women or looking at attractive women, but you know. It's, uh, it's hard for me to draw like Cameron Diaz I had to do recently, and it was a bit of a struggle. You know, it's like I have to—I can't be—I can't be a wise guy with that kind of thing. I have to sort of be respectful. But that's the most difficult for me. You know, if the face is is interesting, as I as I like to call them, like a, a Howard Stern or Woody Allen or you know someone with very expressive. Like that's why I love drawing comedians because their faces are very expressive, and you know as soon as the camera's on, they, they just they won't stop. So. <laughs> Not so much in Woody Allen's case, but I still love drawing his face. In fact, I have a portrait of him coming up in the next Jewish Comedian's book where he's not smiling, he doesn't look happy, but there he is. Well, I noticed the the one that's in The Fun Never Stops was a picture of him as a sports writer, which is great because we all know his love for sports anyway, but he was kind of pissed about that picture, I guess. He was... Uh, I, he, I heard from the editor of the New York Observer because Woody wrote a piece for the New York Observer about... His love affair with the New York Knicks. So he, so they put it on the cover and they asked me to illustrate it. So I have him courtside, clacking away at his Underwood typewriter, <laughs> looking at the reader with his with his fedora on, his press pass. But I, you know, I guess I played up his freckles and and or, and or liver spots, and that's what he took offense to. And he had his sister call the editor of the New York Observer and say that you know Woody won't write for your paper again. Oh so God. I felt bad about it because I love Woody Allen. I love his films and the funny films and the unfunny films. My father's actually been in a couple of his films as an actor. So I, I felt bad about it, but, you know, I, I have no regrets about the way I drew him. When I was a kid, I saw the opening credits of um, Play It Again, Sam, and they, the, the director comes in close on Woody's face, and he's just like, those freckles are there. It's like, obvious, it's clear. <laughs> so I never forgot that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I know you were able to patch things up with uh, Jerry Lewis, who might have, or maybe there wasn't a problem. I don't know. You know, I want to talk about the Spy Magazine sequence of uh, the article about the day the clown cried. Sure. And um, you explain to people about this movie, because it is one of these weird movies that I think some people know about and are just amazed at how bizarre the circumstances are. And then there's a lot of people that don't know about this film, because it was never released. Well, I'll sum it up quickly. Yeah, it was never released. It was never completed. But um, Spy Magazine, 20 years ago, uh, wrote a piece, Bruce Handy, wrote this piece called uh, uh, Analyzing the Film, uh, just based on what the few people who had seen it, and one of them was Harry Shearer, I know that, I forget mm-hmm. some of the other people, but what you know, their take on it was. So I've never seen it, I'd only heard about it, called The Day of the Clown Cry, it was Jerry Lewis's take on the Holocaust. He played a Dutch um, comedian or, or circus clown who's in, who's in a concentration camp and, and entertains the kids as they're going into the gas chamber. That was the, wow. the premise. And, you know, maybe not the best idea for Jerry, you know, to not, and, and, and actually recently Jerry has, like, said it was a mistake to do. He actually, when people ask him about it, he used to get very defensive. Now he just basically says, it was a mistake for me to do it. My friend um, James Kaplan co-wrote the book with Jerry, um, Dean and Me. Okay. And he, he talked to Jerry recently about it, and Jerry said, yes, it was a mistake. So he admits it, but I've never seen it, but the Spy Magazine wrote this piece, and they asked me to illustrate it. And having never seen it, you know, they said, "Can you just draw draw him like with the kids, like leading the kids into the into the gas chamber?" And and that was all I had to go on, basically. So I tried to be as respectful as I could, you know, as far you know, as far as the article itself. Sure. Yeah, it was the people sort of making fun of the you know the film and the premise and everything, and and having fun with it. But I tried to be as respectful as I could when I did the illustration. So I have no idea if Jerry ever even realized that I'm the guy who did those illustrations. But you know. The, the cool thing is later, um, and you have these two different features in The Fun Never Stops, uh, the, the one is just a year of success for Jerry when uh, everything's going great and he's uh, you know to the point of Hollywood uh, the Hollywood sign being changed to Hey Lady. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and on the other side, you do this 
very well done sequence that kind of justifies the need that maybe Jerry Lewis deserves the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Motion Picture Academy. Well, that's my feeling. I'm, I'm, I'm a lifelong Jerry Lewis fan. I love Jerry Lewis. You know, m- most of his films and, you know, uh, his, just his whole persona. I'm, you know, I have, I'm a, uh, I know that, you know, to, to say that to, to some people, it's like you raise eyebrows and stuff, but I'm a no apologies Jerry Lewis fan, and always have been. So I did this plea to the Motion Picture Academy to give the guy a Lifetime Achievement Award, and I, I have, I think, nine reasons why. One of them was he was the first comedian to actually direct himself in movies since Charlie Chaplin, mm-hmm. and his films were incredibly successful, and he was innovative in, in, in his camera work and his use of color, and, and he invented... Uh, uh, video assist, which directors use to this day, which is uh, shooting your film on video before you actually film, uh, put it on film so you mm-hmm. can watch it ahead of time. And now it sounds like, you know, it's like obviously that's what they do, but he was the first guy who did that in the early 60s, and a lot of other things, to how he influenced so many young comedians and directors, taught George Lucas and Steven Spielberg at USC, et cetera, et cetera. So there was a plea that, like, give him an Oscar. A lot of people uh, have, like, sort of gone on record, like Peter Bogdanovich is also, like, gotten behind that campaign to give Jerry Lewis a special Oscar. So it might not happen, but, you know. And then the other piece was just sort of a, a little more fun about how <laughs> 19, 2005, he, he actually received the, the Los Angeles Film Critics Life, Lifetime Achievement Award at the beginning of the year. So I did a take on that, like, okay, this is going to be Jerry's big year. And <laughs> this, these are all the other things that are going to happen to him. So it's in the fun never stops. And I had fun with it. I think he saw the piece and enjoyed it. He's actually called me a few times, and he's enjoyed you know, how I've drawn him and the, the piece I did on him and old Jewish comedian's book he loved. That's cool. Uh, and he gave me a great quote for, the, for, for that, too, to they, use in the sequel. We're, we're, we're pals. That's, that's amazing. And it seems to be your life in general, uh, because of your father as well, that you've always been around famous people. You mentioned your dad earlier that he was in a Woody Allen film, but, you know, you, your dad, Bruce J. Friedman, for people who don't know, uh, among his film credits... Some of the movies, you know, Splash was one of his films, and Star Crazy, had Gene Wilder and Richard Pryor, and The Lonely Guy was based on his book, The Lonely Guy's Book of Life, with the Steve <laughs> Martin movie, and then The Heartbreak Kid was based on a short story. That's being, actually being remade with with um, Ben Stiller right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of nervous. I love that. Yeah, I'm kind of, <laughs> I'm kind of dreading it, but you know, we'll <laughs> see. I think uh, when I heard that Gwyneth Paltrow is going to be playing the unattractive wife that he dumps, it's like I, I don't know where they're going with this, but we'll see. <laughs> but, but yeah, it was like, uh, yeah, meeting some of these people, of, you know, as a, as a kid was always fun. You know, I think I mentioned to you last time we talked that I went to Groucho Marx's house as a kid, and that yes. was a real thrill. <laughs> And, you know, it's like, I guess, you know, that's something you just, you know, it's not like a, a normal thing that a kid would do, but, you know, there I was. And and I think I mentioned before, but I, we, you know, we, we were invited to Groucho's house in 1975. He was an old Groucho. He had already had a few strokes, but he was still, like, singing songs, and every every line was a punchline. And then we were invited back the next week because Groucho was getting together with Mae West. They hadn't seen each other for 35 years since they were both at Paramount, and we declined the invitation. We wow. sort of, We sort of said, like, yeah, we had enough Groucho, you know. <laughs> So to this, to this day, I, I, I regret that. Wow. But, you know, live and learn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you mentioned in our last talk, too, that your dad worked for um, Martin Goodman's magazine division, and it was the same company that, you know, obviously Stan Lee and Marvel was part of. Right. So I go way back with comic books because I grew up, you know, visiting my dad at the, the company, worked there until 1966. He was the magazine editor at Med, Men's Adventure Magazines, and... Marvel Comics was right next, you know, the, the office next door was Stan Lee's office, so mm-hmm. I grew up, like, Uncle Stan, like, was always, like, part of my childhood. We get stacks and stacks of Marvel Comics. Well, and, I've, and I've noticed from the book as well that uh, you had quite the memorabilia collection, and I'm assuming still do. Yeah, I toned it down. A lot of that stuff has been thrown out, and I'm very particular about what I, you know, I'm not really a collector, but I, I pick up things here and there, and I save things. But, uh, yeah, I was always, a, you know, a little late. I, I was very influenced by Forrest J. Ackerman, the editor of Famous Monsters. His, his house, he was always showing pictures of it in, the, in his magazine, and the whole house was filled with his stuff, great, you know, his books and his mm-hmm. the things he had picked up over the years, like movie memorabilia. So I was a, I and a bunch of other, you know, I know I found out later a lot of other kids were obsessed with that house, and so I had my own little mini Acker mansion in my bedroom <laughs> growing up. So some of the photographs of that are in this book. 
actually Dan Close, when he saw the book, he, you know, he, he enjoyed the book and he wrote the introduction, but he said, I'd love to see a book of just photographs of your bedroom from when you were a kid. So <laughs> maybe that'll be one of them. I, I, unfortunately, I only have about 15 photos from, from, but there was a point where Life Magazine was interested in photographing it as the craziest kid's bedroom in the USA. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't happen, but yeah, that, that could have been fun. That's cool. And then my grandmother actually almost fainted when she came into the room once. You know, she she got dizzy and she had to sit down. And, you know. and then some of the our housekeepers, neighbors, or our friends used to come visit just because they heard about the room. It was sort of like a legendary room in the neighborhood in, in on Long Island where we lived. <laughs> the uh, the introduction to the book is great because all right the uh, the whole biography section as well because uh, man I mean you, you the the book itself focuses on the last fifteen years or so of your work but it's it's so great to hear about everything. And it's funny because I think people saw a lot of your work without being aware of who you were, and, and not just magazine pieces, but things like when you were working for Tops. I remember the Barfo family candy, <laughs> and it's like, oh, that's True Friedman. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm, you know, I, I guess I keep a low profile and stuff. So that article like opened up, I guess, a few people's eyes. That it first appeared in Comic Art Magazine, written by Ben Schwartz. And I thought I was so happy with it, I wanted to, you know, use it in this book just as sort of an introduction to me because I haven't really, you know, my last book was, my last anthology of comics came out in the early 90s, warts and all. Mm -hmm. So there really hasn't been a collection of comics since then. So that, I just thought that piece served as a great introduction for younger people who might not be aware, you know, of what, what I've done before. So this book is, is more of an anthology of, it, does, it doesn't really actually include all the illustration work I've done over the 15, last 15 years of or so it's basically all the last of the stipple work I did in the, in the early to mid '90s, post warts and all, and then all the comic strips I've done, many of them co-written by my wife Kathy. Um, for you know, uh, but most you know, mostly the comic strips. So then there'll be uh, another book or two books which will focus more on the illustration work, which I've you know a lot of people know me from that from the New York Observer and mm -hmm. stuff from the last few years. Well, tell me about working with Kathy because you guys started collaborating in the in the mid '80s. Yeah, we just uh, well, like we we met in the, we met in the, the mid '80s, and we just hit it off. We had a similar sense of humor right off the bat, and then you know we just it was just it just seemed to ha happen naturally where we just like bounce ideas off each other. And, and to this day, if I if I'm struggling with something or we just work out concepts, and you know it's just a perfect relationship, a perfect arrangement that way. Here's another uh, couple covers that I remember from the 90s uh, that came from He Said, She Said comics, and they focused on the scandals of uh, Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky and Woody Allen again with, uh, with Soon Yi. Did you just do the covers, or did you do interiors? I just did for the covers. That had nothing to do with the interior of the, of the comics, and these guys contacted me, and I wasn't really interested, but they paid me what I asked for. So I just did the covers. I did Woody Allen. It was a He Said, She Said was the series. They did Woody Allen versus Mia Farrow. And it was Bill, actually Bill Clinton versus Jennifer Flowers at the time. Ah, okay. So, you know, I, you know, as long as I was able to do what I wanted and make them kind of fun and silly, and I didn't want anything to be, like, gratuitously cruel or nasty or anything, and I had to have fun with them. And then, would, sure enough, they asked me to do a third comic, which was O.J. and his you know, his late wife, and that, that one I declined because I didn't, you know, there wasn't any humor there for me. So. Sure. So, but I had nothing to do with the interiors, and, you know, <laughs> and that's it. Okay. But, you know, I, 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 you know, like I said, I love drawing Woody Allen, so that was a natural. And Bill Clinton was sort of brand new at the time, I think. I don't even think he was elected when I did those, but I'm not sure. But, you know, it was just another assignment. <laughs> Tell me about another piece in the book, uh, Magic Johnson. <laughs> and I'm just going to, I won't describe it. I'll let people like see in the book exactly what it is. <laughs> but I won't describe it either because I'm not even sure what he, exactly he's doing. But it was done for Howard Stern's book, Private Parts. And he just had uh, like a, a page he wrote about Magic Johnson. And so they asked me to draw that. You know, so I didn't argue. I said, okay, because I had been hired to do illustrations for his book. And he said, well, we want Magic sort of sitting on the phone and, and you know, and you know, you, you you can see the book, the drawing in the book. It's Absolutely. hard to describe. I guess. In fact, I heard from one the my my friend Ben Schwartz who wrote the introduction of the book. He said he showed the drawing to his mother, and that was the one drawing that his mother was upset by. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's pretty innocent. You don't really see anything. You know, it's not that you know in your face or anything. What no. he's actually doing, I don't know what he's doing. No, he could be doing anything. Absolutely. He could be like, yeah, I'm not sure what he's doing in there. Absolutely. <laughs> well, and now it's funny because I wanted to also go back to your formative years at the School for Visual Arts, uh, because 
a guy like Harvey Kurtzman, whose class you took, I guess, a couple times, sometimes would even tell you, hey, wait a minute, you've gone too far this time. <laughs> and I think that's pretty amazing to get a guy like the creator of Mad Magazine to go, oh, wait a minute, you don't want to go that far. <laughs> He, he was, it wasn't that he was thinking. He thought I went too far. It was, he he um, was. So it wasn't quite clear about what I was up to or what I was actually, you know, what my goals were. But he always enjoyed the work and he appreciated it. And I took his class for three years and we got along great and everything. And sometimes the class would get out of hand, but you know, he I know he he just got a charge out of it. At one point, he actually called me during the summer and said, "Friedman, I'm thinking of starting a new humor magazine. Would would you be editor?" Wow. Well, you know, I, I couldn't believe the phone call. I said, yes, of course. <laughs> and, you know, it's classic Harvey Kurtzman because I never heard a thing about it again. He never followed up or anything. Uh, that's classic Harvey, you know, from people who know him. and say, yeah, that would, that would be typical Harvey. But um, but it was a thrill to have him as a teacher and, and be, just be with him. All the, the, all the students in the class just loved being around him. And then all he would get these great guests just showing up or, or he'd invite them like every week practically, like Robert Crumb could walk in or, or guys from the New Yorker, or, you know, like legendary guys like that would just walk in because they happened to be in New York. So it was just a, a lot of fun. And this was a single panel? like he focused on single panel New Yorker style cartoons. Yeah. He thought that was like the respectable world of cartooning was, was that. So um, he didn't really talk about his comics. He didn't really want to discuss them. He rarely talked about Mad. He was proud of the fact he invented Mad, but he didn't focus on comics or sequential art at all. Although he'd bring in piles of, piles of comics and he, he get stuff sent to him from all over the world, especially from France. So he'd bring in all these piles of these French comic magazines, you know, for just for the students to go through. But that's not what he taught. He taught single panel gag cartoons. That's what he emphasized anyway. And sure enough, when he was editor, he was cartoon editor at Esquire in the late 70s, mid to late 70s, and that's what he was doing. He was just doing single panel uh, cartoons at sure. the time. How, how does your stuff play internationally? I mean, it is very American-centric, but, I mean, you know, we dominate the world, so our culture does, so I would think that there's there's interest, you know. You tell me. Um, I get uh, occasional, occasional like, emails from guys from, you know, around the world. I got a, an email from a guy from Ireland who wanted to buy some of the Jewish comedian artwork, which I thought was, you know, funny. <laughs> kind of strange, but... Um, a lot of it doesn't play. I, I'm, I'm assuming a lot of it doesn't really go over because people are just like drawing a blank on who these people are. When I did the book Warts and All, Art Spiegelman insisted on having a glossary back there because he said the people are just not going to know who Joey Heverton is, you know, in <laughs> France or you know, like that. So you know, I went along with it. I'm glad I did because the glossary could, was kind of fun. But um, I'm, I'm really not sure of how, how the stuff goes over. You know, I, I occasionally I'll get an email from Japan like you know, like that, but. Um, uh, I haven't really thought about it much. It's mostly geared towards this country, you know, which is fine by me. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about working with Howard Stern, because um, I uh, I noticed a couple of the pieces. You know, you mentioned a couple from from his book, but now was Fred and Fred and Ricky joining Nambla? Was that from a Stern piece as well? Or? Yeah, that was actually a radio piece <laughs> that he, he originally did on the radio, and then he wanted to transfer it to a comic strip. So he, he sent Kathy and I the text to the radio the radio transcript you know and so we turned it into we blocked it out and turned it into the comic strip so it was uh w when he did it, it was very fun i remember hearing it on the radio and, and billy west who did great voices back then on oh, the yeah. show was was part of it and and, and and fred norris also did great voices on the show so um so we transferred that into the comic strip they ran in private parts and now it's in the fun never stops and it's basically you know fred mertz and ricky ricardo um Joining, you know, joining the, the the organization NAMBLA, which is the North American Man Boy Love Association. And, Jesus. You know, I can go into why they like, have Fred and Ricky joining the organization, but it's you know, just look at the comic, you'll see. Oh sure. Well, <laughs> <laughs> William Foley is one of your guys because I I remember seeing that you know Fred Burt's after work after hours or whatever. That was one of the first things uh, that my brother Josh and I collaborated on in like around 1980. Was at the after hour, what Fred Mertz does after you know late at night when he's out on you know off on his own, like you know when Ethel's uh, when Ethel's in bed. So it's you know, he, he's a he's a loan shark and he's a pimp and he burns down the building finally and he, he's you know that's in the one that's in the first book I did. 
person is living or dead. But that was a fun piece. Yeah, William Farrell is one of my guys. It's like I love drawing him, of course. <laughs> I still love, and I'm glad that they put this in the book. The uh, the cover from Screw Magazine with uh, with Shep Howard on the cover. Well, yeah, that was an early one too. That was I remember when it came out in the early '80s. You know, I lived in Manhattan still at the time, so I walked around and I just remember seeing like people looking at newsstands, completely confused by that fa- that Shep Howard face staring back at them. You know, like old grizzled bums, like you know, waking up in the morning and staring at the newsstand, just being you know confused. I remember taking it in, and a few of my friends did the same. Walked around just like looking at people's reaction to the thing. So, um, but it was my brother was an editor there at the time, so I was sort of I had carte blanche to do what I wanted. So I didn't really want to do any sex cartoons or anything obvious. So I said, well, let me just like draw. Let me just stick some, you know, like some of these beloved faces on on the cover and see what happens. So. He was one, and Dwight Fry I did, and Tor Johnson, a few other people like that. <laughs> <laughs> How about your heavy metal work? Because that seems like the furthest thing from your style of celebrity parody, but you made, you made it work, and you kind of throw these these science fiction uh, concepts in with, with the, the parodies of the celebrities. Well, that was the tricky one, because I went up to heavy metal first, wanted to, wanting to be a national ampoo, and heavy metal was, was run by the same company mm-hmm. at the time in the early 80s, so... I wasn't I wasn't getting anywhere with National Lampoon at the time, so I just said, oh, I'll, you know, what the hell, I've tried heavy metal, so I showed my stuff to Julie Simmons, and I could hear her laughing in her office. I was sitting out in the hallway, and then she gave me an uh She said, well, could you do a page for us? And I said, yeah, okay, but I, as it says in uh, Ben Schwartz's introduction, I loved Jimmy Olsen comics when I was a kid, the, those ridiculous comics where he was, he joined the Nazi party, he becomes a werewolf, or he turns into the giant lizard, or whatever. Sure. I just, they were so absurd, they got so out of hand. My favorite actually was the Planet of the Capes piece, which was, like, I think, a couple of issues where it was right when Planet of the Apes came out, so they had Planet of the Capes, which I heard years later was written by Jim Shooter, so he's had my respect for doing that. Very cool. That series, but... <laughs> So that was my that was my you know reference point those those Jimmy Olsen comics so you know so I just you know I have torch uh, uh, Joe Besser um, the incredible shrinking Joe Besser basically taking the the, the 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 Jimmy Olsen concepts and and combining them with 50s science fiction concepts the movie concepts and 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 then turning these you know uh, throwing Joe Dorita in in the mix and Joe Besser and Ernest Borgnine and like that so you know they were fun to do I think they probably confused most of heavy metal's readers but that's fine. <laughs> I think actually, I think it was a good kind of interlude in between puffs when you're uh, when you're looking at the weird Mobius stuff to yeah, suddenly but see. But I sort of got too like it was sort of refreshing. Like uh, yes, a lot of people discovered my work through that, you know, because it was like it was an unexpe- unexpected place to find find the stuff, I guess. But I, w- I you know I did a regular thing for them for a couple of years. Well, and that's a th- you know it's funny. I thought that was lampoon stuff, but I think it must have been me reading heavy metal because I remember uh, Arthur Godfrey hanging out with aliens. And yeah, well, yeah, that pretty was much ignoring metal. them. <laughs> well, we're hanging out with mutants. You know, yes. <laughs> and being cruel to them, too. <laughs> as, he, as he wonders how famous he is. <laughs> yeah, he's just like, yeah, he's more obsessed with himself. And he's, you know, I, don't, I, I can't explain that one. I know that's a, that was a, a, a popular with a few people. Like a lot of, somebody bought the original art off of me years ago on that one. But, um, yeah, that was one of, that was, most of that stuff was in heavy metal. A lot of the stuff that was in the first book was, originally appeared in heavy metal, like the Ernest Borgnine piece where in the future everybody will look like Ernest Borgnine in, in Baltimore. <laughs> you know, that was the first one I did for heavy metal. That was, that was fun. That's, That's awesome. what actually got me the job. I did that piece and thinking, okay, well, this is the first and last time I worked for them. And, but they loved it, so, you know, <laughs> I, I continued in that vein. Well, and now you're working for Matt, and how often do you do stuff for Matt? Uh, every I do not every issue, but you know maybe every other issue. You okay, know, it's fun. I mean, that's like a childhood dream come true. Doing stuff for Mad, you know, I enjoy. I you know, it's it's they most of the material they give me is great, and, and I enjoy doing it. And it's just fun to be part of that mix and and up here and there with more Drucker and Al Jaffe and Sergio Gonis and these guys I love since I was a little squirt. Sure. And they're all sweet guys, too. All the old guys are sweet. The young guys are, are not so... No, the young guys are okay, too. But all these old cartoonists, every time I meet them, they're just just—they're all great. That's cool. I had the pleasure of meeting Eric Onis last year at uh, the San Diego Convention. And, yeah, he's an amazingly great yeah, guy. He's a terrific guy. And Al Jaffe's one of the sweetest guys I've ever met. And so is Mort Drucker. Very cool. Um, is, is there still room for gross-out humor for kids... Because I almost wonder with today's sensibilities and always protecting the children, if some of the stuff you did 10, 15 years ago maybe wouldn't fly today. 
Yeah, I'm not so sure it would. I, I don't know. I, I don't really follow it too much, but I did contribute to a, a recent top series called Hollywood Zombies, which was, I don't know if you saw any of it, but it was uh, Hollywood, it was like Hollywood celebrities and other kind of celebrities, but they're, 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 the, the concept is that they become zombies. So now they're like, they've, they're attacking the paparazzi and stuff. And <laughs> I did a few of them. I did, a, I did, um, uh, Lindsay Lohan, like running down paparazzi in, in Hollywood, in, in, in a, um, in a Beetle, in, you know, in a, uh, Volkswagen. So it ties into that movie role of the Herbie thing. So it's kind of clever, but I did a few of those. I don't know if, how well they went over. I haven't really heard much reaction, it, but you know, it's, I don't think, I mean, the Garbage Pail Kids, like, was a huge phenomenon 20 years ago, 15 years ago, whenever, but, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if that stuff can, can go over like that now that, you know, kids are just so obsessed with, like, the computer and, and video games and stuff. And these are trading cards. Just yeah, to, yeah, to, they're trade, yeah, trading cards. Sure. That's what the, these Hollywood zombies were. And I, I don't know if there's a huge market for that stuff anymore. Okay. I'm just not sure. But maybe I'm not the right guy to ask. I don't really follow that stuff too much. I don't have kids, so I don't really know what they're, what they're looking at. Sure. I have beagles. <laughs> well, there you go. Now you got to do stuff for Animal Planet. Like, Legal, they're just as obsessed with food. That's about basically it. <laughs> you can just mock all the, like, Rin Tin Tin, it's Night Out, and Lassie right. and stuff. The, um, I'm looking in the book now, and uh, one of the one of the pieces you did uh, shows that you won't be seeing this fall. Dancing with the Star Chefs. I mean, really, reality TV, and we kind of talked about this before, is breeding its own new kind of, you know, vein of celebrities. Mm -hmm. According to that comic art piece, you kind of switched your style a bit when that comic, and forgive the phrase, Zeitgeist was kind of following the same thought patterns you had in terms of satire. I mean, you're the first guy I knew of that was making fun of Ed Wood movies. And well, crazy I, stuff I'm not like sure that. I was ever, even ever making fun of them. That's like the, the, the tricky part is like, was I making fun of stuff or was I paying tribute to it? Or, you know, or, or you figure it out for yourself. You know, sure. I can't really say, um, you know, Ed Wood films were like goofy and fun to watch and used to watch them a lot when I was younger and, and have Ed Wood parties and Plan 9 parties and stuff. But I also have a, a tremendous amount of respect for what he did and some of those scenes in Plan 9 from Outer Space especially are beautifully filmed, the graveyard sequences. So I never took a smug attitude towards any of that stuff. You know, his films and, you know, the, 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 most of the stuff I draw and the people I draw, I have some kind of, I have to have some kind of admiration for. I just wouldn't want to spend the time. The, my, my, the, the, I'm not interested in all of just attacking people or, or making fun of people necessarily. I mean, what I do is it sort of, evol like, it's organi it organically happens. I mean, it comes out the way it, it comes out because I suppose I want it to be honest. But mainly I want it to be funny and stuff. But I, I don't want to, you know, I never wanted to take a smug, superior attitude towards any of this stuff. But, yeah, I, if, if, the, if, if I was the first guy, like, who was at least, like, people said they... And they had never heard of Tor Johnson until they started seeing him in some of my comics and stuff. And I don't know if that's a great achievement or anything, but I, I basically turned him into a comic character because he just seemed to fit into that mold of, you know, Dondi and, and Daddy Warbucks and <laughs> Little Orphan Annie, you know, guys with white eyes or bl with those blank eyes. They just seem like a natural. So, <laughs> Which came first, the rubber mask of Tor or, or your uh, illustrations of Tor? Cause they oh, were well, rubber mask appeared in the early 60s, I think, okay. you know, on the back of the Monster Magazine. Sure. And Tor actually, like, um, they, they used his face as a mold. Okay. You know, oh you know, maybe he, was, he, was, he had time on his hands, but he actually sat down and they, they used his face. The Don Post Studios, I believe, used his, his that Tor, you know, his, he actually sat down and, like, photographs of him them, them putting the, the clay on his face and making the mold, so. It was a Tor Johnson mask, but it was always advertised as thug or, or or bald guy. Or, it was never said. It never said Tor Johnson head. It was always like thug, usually. <laughs> Jeez. Well, let me ask you about a couple of your characters. Well, actually, I'm assuming one is a real person, and uh, that's uh, the doctor. Uh, who uh, did he marry Helen Hayes or something, or or just? I think he. Well, he had uh, a love affair with Helen Hayes in, in this book. At, at one at point, he. Um, I forget what I forget the premise of that piece, but um, I believe he's um, he, he's giving all the various lines or the ways that he was able to strip Helen Hayes. Basically, yeah, exactly. that's yeah, literally yeah, the yeah. title of the. Yeah, so he had he did have an affair with. Usually, he's having an affair with um, Kim Basinger or something like okay. that. All of a sudden, he's had an affair with Helen Hayes. Now, is this he was actually he was a real guy. I'm, I'm not going to mention his name. Okay, but, uh, but he was a real guy uh, who I sort of casually knew at the time. He was a friend of a friend, and uh, he just appeared, and I thought, okay, well, you know, I'll throw him in a comic. <laughs> 
And there was no rhyme or reason to it. But, you know, he, he came and he went, you know, and then people got sick of him, which is good. You know? Okay. <laughs> people started complaining about it. Like, uh, you know, I sort of had enough of the doctor. So that was, that was, that was the end of him. Well, how about, how about the Duke of Eltingville? Where did he come from? He's also based on an old friend of mine who lived on, in Eltingville, Staten Island, which was an f- interesting place for me because, well, we used to visit Staten Island when I was younger because my friend, the cartoonist Mark Newgarden, lived there at the time. So I had never been there before, but it was like a, a, you know, a new borough in New York, so it was fascinating, but this guy also lived on, in, in, a, in a section called Eltingville, and it was interesting because Eltingville was just always wet, like even on a sunny day, the streets were always wet for some reason, so I never, you know, <laughs> I never forgot that, it was like the streets were always like flooded, even though, you know, for, for some reason, it was just, like that struck me, but this guy was, um, this guy was, uh, yeah, he lived in Eltingville, and he looked like that, and he spoke like that. Oh my God, he, so he was that. like a natural. You know? <laughs> he actually did car. He did comics too. He like submitted work. To, I remember he submitted work to Robert Crumb in the early '80s to Weirdo magazine. Crumb rejected it, uh, but thought his work, you know, that he should pursue it, which he didn't. But he actually talked like that, in a non sequitur kind of, you know, style. <laughs> and he looked like that, so you know, it was like sort of like given to me like that character. Well, I, I, one of his preoccupations is he, he couldn't understand why Dick York was being replaced as Darren on Bewitched. Yeah, and, well, I was like, oh, I think the premise is that a, a beautiful, sexy woman is coming onto him, and, and that's what he's, that's what that's on his mind, and, and that's all he can think about. You know? And this woman is just like giving herself to him, and he just he can't like let that go. He just can't figure it out. <laughs> or he introduces how, uh, how Dick York could be replaced by uh, Dick Sargent on Bewitched. I, I liked his talk show too when he was about to introduce Noel Coward and, and Mike Tyson comes yeah, that was a, uh, thank you thank you <laughs> that was good. well I'm a big I, Buddy Lake is missing fan I think that's a great I, I movie I was just thinking well okay who, who might be the opposite of a Noel Coward <laughs> like you know it's, it's Mike Tyson came to mind <laughs> <laughs> I actually wanted to at one point I was I was uh, somebody asked me to develop um, uh, an animated show for I think uh, one of those online um it was. It, I forget. You know, I forget the name of it. It was. It was popular a couple of years ago, and it actually had some good cartoons on it. Was it Icebox? I was Icebox. Yeah. Okay. So they contacted me and said, "Could you do a show? You know, we'd love you to do a show." This is right before they went under, of course. So, sure. You know, we can't pay you, but we'll give you stock. And so they said, "Uh oh, okay. that doesn't sound so great." But I, I proposed doing the Lord of Eltingville show or the Duke of Eltingville show because he had two names. So that's a, that's. The, the, what I wanted to do, like just turn that into an animated show, and but they didn't quite get it, so that was the end of that. And then they went under. So what do they know? <laughs> Would <laughs> you? There, Mr. Wong, they did on that show. I thought it was great. I loved Mr. Wong, absolutely. That Bing, was funny. Bing Crosby's former houseboy. Right, right. That was funny. <laughs> I think National Lampoon bought the rights to that, thinking that they were, it was going to be their next Animal House or something, but <laughs> it didn't happen. Would you ever want to do um, Flash animation or any you know uh, animation in general? I have done it a little bit over the years, and um, I've never been happy with the results. I did stuff for um, for the show that Beavis and Butt had started on uh, Liquid TV. Some of mm-hmm. my some mm-hmm. of my cartoons were on there. It was cut animation in the Terry Gilliam style. I wasn't happy with the result, and it was just, um, it didn't look right to me. Okay, it was just my opinion. Other people seem to like it and stuff. And I did stuff for the uh, comedy for HBO Comedy Channel a few years back too. S- similar style of the cutout taking my work and, you know, just sort of, like, moving the hands and the mouth. It was sort of like clutch cargo, you know, sure. which I love, but, you know, <laughs> for my work, I don't think it worked. <laughs> Absolutely. Cool. Didn't quite do it. So I've been approached a few times, you know, over the years lately, and, and I, I, kind of, I, I resisted. Howard Stern wanted to, he got me involved in a project he had going about two years ago, which was going to be Howard Stern, the teenage years. He had a, contra- he had a deal with Spike TV. To do okay. an animated show, Howard Stern, the, te- the teenage years. It was right before Chris Rock's show started, so similar concept. So I did a lot of drawings of Howard as a teenager and his parents and his sister. A lot of drawings, and you know, it didn't go anywhere. But you know, you know the, the, uh, I just think it was bad timing because the Chris Rock show just, you know, happened at the same time, and that was great. So the Howard thing just sort of went away. But you know. Occasionally things come up, but you know it's not really where uh, where I want to go. I'm not that interested in doing that stuff. Have you ever tried drawing with a stylus uh, using a computer as opposed to uh, no pen I and paper? Nope. Okay. No, no. interest. I, well, yeah, I guess not. I guess not. No interest. Or, or I'm just like locked into doing things the old-fashioned way. I love painting. You know, I love um, using the brush and um, with the old Jewish comedian 
book, um, uh, the old one, and the one that I'm working on now, which comes out early next year. It's just everything is painted, and you know I get pleasure out of that. Very cool. Are you going to uh, have anything coming uh, out in between, or is it uh, Fun Never Stops and then uh, the next volume of the Fun Adventures? Never Stops is the recent book, and then there's, uh, I'm hoping there's a collection of the New York Observer covers I've done for the last 15 years. Um, the New York Observer, I've been doing covers. I, I, I um, alternate with three other artists, Robert Grossman, Philip Burke, and Victor Juhas. So it's the 20th anniversary of New York Observer, so uh, it looks like there's going to be a big an- a- anthology of the, the best of the of 20 years, and it's going to be art heavy. So a lot of all, a lot of the covers. So I'm hoping that comes out late, late this year. But you know, before, but after that, the the sequel, oh, more old Jewish comedians, comes out in the early next year. Should be out around March. Very cool. Um, and it's got a great introduction from the legendary comedy writer Larry Gelbart, which I'm, I'm thrilled with. He did a beautiful job. And the difference between the the second this new book and the first book is that there's going to be some female Jewish comedians in the book. Excellent. There's not a lot to choose from from that you know from that era, but uh, there'll be a few. Tony Fields, maybe. She died young, so it gets tricky. She died. Ah. She, she died around fifty. Wow, that's right. Yeah, she died young. Wow. And Fanny Bryce died young. She was like 60. And, um, you know, so I had Phyllis Diller all lined up, and, and, I, and, and she was, I finished, I did the drawing. I always assumed she was Jewish. And then, sure enough, I picked up her autobiography. On page one, it says, you know, people always thought I was Jewish, but uh, I'm not Jewish. <laughs> so that, that's the end of that. <laughs> well, okay, I... but, you know, I got Molly P. Kahn, you know, was never, not necessarily a Jewish comedian, but also, but, but a comic actress. And show she's in there, and and a few others, some obscure ones as well. There's some right. actually some filthy ones, like some X-rated Jewish comedians from the '50s, like Bell Barth and Pearl Williams, who most people don't remember, but they were like the original Sarah Silverman. Wow, that's where were they? So were they just working they were the last clubs? They they would they would they play in legitimate clubs in Miami and and California and New York. And they were never bothered as long as they did not get religion. They didn't mention anything about religion or, or God or anything. As long as they could do filthy material, sexual material, back even back in the fifties. But as soon as you know, they, if they, if like, unlike Lenny Bruce, who like would would go anywhere, they they just kept it to that. If they like were to go, you know, into religion, they would have been arrested and they would have been you know banned. But they never did. So they performed into the seventies, you know, as, as older women. Um, there were a bunch of them. In fact, there might be a book coming out about them um, by uh, uh, my friend Ron Smith, who's a comic com- comedy historian, has been dabbling with possibly doing a, a, a book about the history of 30 Jewish comedians. And there were a lot of them. And then, you know, of course, it would be great to have Sarah Silverman do the introduction to that. Wow, you know, you wonder if she's even aware of uh, the lineage and everything. And if- I have a feeling because I actually got an email from her boyfriend Jimmy Kimmel like last week saying, hey, I love, your bo- I love your books. So I said, hey, that's great. So, you know, tell your girlfriend, Sarah, that the next collection of Jewish comedians will- is going to have some female Jewish comedians in there. So hopefully she got the word. That's cool. You know, and that's, that's the great thing, and that was another thing I-, I learned from the comic art piece, was a lot of guys that I kind of got to know uh, just through following credits on, you know, things like SCTV, who's writing this stuff. And, you know, so you mentioned Howard Stern, but Eddie Gordetsky and all these guys, uh, you know, and now you mentioned Kimmel and stuff. It's it's really cool that, you know, all the cool kids love you. I mean, it's you know, nice that's, know, that's, you, that's nice to know when people are uh, aware of what you do. And, you know, it's always it's always fun, you know, to enjoy what you're doing, and you know, no matter who it is. But, you know, sure. those kind of guys, uh, especially guys I admire, like a Howard Stern or, or Jimmy Kimmel or... Uh, Jerry Lewis. That's 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 always great, you know, to find out. And one little treat I had was um, I, I got the first old Jewish comedian uh, is uh, who actually asked to be in the book. I got a letter from Larry Storch from from you know wow. from Troop and saying I would love to be in your sequel. And sure enough, so he sent it, sent me a great photo that you know was perfect reference. So sure enough, you know he's going to be in the sequel, but. I was thrilled to find, you know, to, to, I got a letter from a guy who wants, you know, one of these, like, legendary Jewish comedians who wants to be in the sequel. So Absolutely. That was a treat. <laughs> Man, that's the guy from F-Troop for people listening who don't yeah, remember yeah, the name. Was, actually, he, uh, people will remember mainly from F-Troop, you know, he was you know, the Civil War, uh, you know, the show. Uh, the Cowboy Show. Was, of course, that was Forrest Tucker, but he's actually a great mimic, 
and had like a big career in the 50s and 60s as a, mim- a comic and a mimic. But he's the first guy who who did the Judy, Judy, Judy impression of Cary Grant. <laughs> that, you know, people just think of now, if you think about it, as, you know, the Cary Grant impression. Judy, sure. Judy, Judy. He was the guy who invented that <laughs> on stage. He did Judy, and it was actually a routine between Cary Grant and Judy Garland. We do her voice, too. So it was both. Wow. You know, that's where it came from. A little, little bit of trivia there. I had, I had no idea he did impressions. That's amazing. I mean, I yeah, just, he, was, you know. he was great. He, did, you know, I don't know if there's a lot of vo- uh, video of it or footage, but he was. That was one of his. He was a great mimic, you know. But he would go beyond just doing impressions. He would like, like sort of like Frank Gorshin. He would contort his whole body into becoming the person like that. Wow. Well, and to contrast all the all the comedy and celebrities that we're talking about, there's a couple. Serious, but I, I don't know if they're if they are serious pieces. I don't know how to classify them, but um, you know, in, in the in the current book, I'm, I'm looking at uh, you know he had a funny face. That's a that's an amazing kind of one page piece of irony. And then the really sad thing, Reds. It it just seems like there's you know just some some lonely people and just kind of those you know the eight million stories in the naked city kind of uh, motif of these two pieces. Right, right. Well, uh, uh, one person, uh, one guy. Um, my friend Paul Karazak, who wrote the book on Fletcher Hanks, which is like, uh, which is out now, which is great, which I recommend. But he said he thought the the piece um, on he had a funny, funny face, which is kind of a tragic piece. But he thought it was the funniest comic strip he's ever read. So you never know. <laughs> but so you can derive humor out of anything. Um, but yeah, the, that piece and and the Reds piece, both both of which originally ran in Raw mag in Raw magazine when it became the booklet in the early nineties, but. You know, didn't really set out to be funny, but you know, you can derive humor from the situations, from you know, this guy running this bar. I don't know if you've heard the legendary red ta- uh, two bar tapes, which that comic strip was based on the the Reds piece. The, no, the harassing phone calls to this bartender in Jersey City, um, and the person making the phone call taped all the calls. It was like hours of of tapes of just harassing, and the guy goes ballistic. The bartender, Red goes ballistic and screams at the guy and curses him and, and just, you know, it just, uh, it's unending. And it's, and in fact, the Mo character from The Simpsons is based on, uh, Matt Groening will, will, will not admit this, but the Mo character is based on Red. The, the phone calls that Bart Simpson makes to the bar. Sure. Or based on this whole, the, the legendary tapes, and then Howard Stern has played them over the years. He has to play them. Edited versions, I don't know if he does anymore, but <laughs> he has to play edited versions because they're so filthy. But that's what this comic was, ba- comic was based on. It was written by Mark Newgarden. You know, like um, the the private life of the guy making the calls, and then Red himself. You know, before and after the phone calls come in, you know, what what their lives were really like. Sure. Combined in this, in this piece. So. <laughs> While you were at uh, National Lampoon, you were able to bring a few guys over to do comics. Guys that you know are, are very popular in the independent scene now, like Chris Ware. Who do you like right now? I mean, do you do you read much uh, as far as any indie uh, comics or mainstream? Or yeah, I have I have a few favorites, and mostly they're just, you know the same same. It's uh, favorites I've had over the years. Like I love Dan Close's work and Chris Ware and Robert Crumb and Kaz and Mark Mark, New, Mark Newgarden came out with a great anthology of his work uh, two years ago. And you know some of the guys I've I've loved over the years, and you know I I also enjoy a lot of uh, new work from from uh, all different kinds of cartoonists. I don't want to mention names because I'm going to forget some names and okay. I don't want to upset anybody. But and then there's a lot of great illustrators like uh, caricaturists and illustrators whose work I really admire. You know who, whose work still appears in magazines and, and like that. So there's so many people, and you know again, and even Mad Magazine has terrific new artists that they you know int- they keep introducing. So I, I don't want to mention names because uh, I know I'll forget. You know. No <laughs> and also lists are always boring. But oh yeah, <laughs> well no, but people always you know are curious of what you're reading and stuff. But you you mentioned a few names. That's cool. I love the the, the new Fletcher Hanks book. You know, um, I guess you've seen that. Um, D- yeah, the, I am the conqueror destroying all worlds. Or yeah, yeah, I love that stuff. And you know, <laughs> stuff. I mean, I was aware of it, but a lot of people are discovering that for the first time. So that's a treat. You know, comics that were done like 60, 70 years ago, I think. And you know, uh, totally unknown to people, but, you know, and that, there it is, and, you know, the guy was just out there, he was a, he was a wacko, but he, you know, was doing comics, and he was he, he, sort of the Ed Wood of comics, is how he's been labeled now, which, you know, I'm not sure that works, but I recommend that book. That's cool. What, is there any interest, like the way Kurtzman used to parody Super Duper Man and, and Starchy and all all of that stuff would would any you know any kind of parodies like that? I mean, you you were, you made fun of celebrity characters like the Three, the three Stooges and the Bowery Boys and people like that. 
Um, but I mean, any interest in like dipping into the superhero world or, or comics world in general, or Blondie or anybody like that, and taking your style into into those ar- arenas? Um, I haven't. I haven't really thought. Of, I mean, I think I've done that a little bit in the past, but I haven't really thought about that lately. Okay. Um, no, I don't. I don't think so. I mean, I'm sure it'll come up, but I. I think I've done superhero parodies in the past, or you know, or, or simple. Uh, I'm trying to think, but you know, it's so hard to compete these days with. Somebody actually asked me, like, how can you like do something like a parody or a, some or satire now and compete with the Daily Show or, or the Colbert Report or, or stuff that just pops up on the internet immediately? It's mm-hmm. so hard. So, sure enough, I you know, come up with some great concept for. I do a regular piece for now for New Republic. But I'm terrified between the time I do the piece and it comes out that it's just going to show up on the Daily Show the exact same concept. So you know, it's yeah, you just have to. You know, fortunately, most of the work I do just comes out immediately. Like I'll, I'll finish a cover for the New York Observer on a Tuesday evening and it's out Wednesday morning, so I can breathe a sigh of relief. Well, that's good. Yeah, I was going to ask that. Okay. Cause yeah, but then you know, Mad still like you do something for Mad and it comes out a month later, two months later, and it's like between that time, it's like oh my god, it's, you know, you know, you're going to see something similar or you know on the daily show or, or somewhere else like, you know, well, it's, you know, it's just not like it used to be at the at the risk of somebody beating you to it i i thought of you this week when uh the government announced that uh part of the watch that they're doing now on potential terrorist groups that they're looking at gangs of gangs of boys or gangs of men Mm-hmm. And immediately I'm like, oh, I could easily see like you doing something where you know the NSA busts into the Bowery Boys meeting or something <laughs> like that. Good. And, see, good. I'm going to steal that. Please, I hope you do. <laughs> I That's truly good. I like that. <laughs> I just did. Uh, I do. I did a cover. There's a magazine called The Week, which is a news magazine. So I, I did their the last week's cover, and I, they gave me the concept, which which I was happy with because it was a quick deadline. It was the day Carl Rove resigned, so the concept was. Bush is like a little boy on the White House lawn. He's lost his balloon, and the balloon is Carl Rove's head floating away. I thought it was a good concept, and, and, but I was terrified that uh, that I was just going to see it. Like like between the time I finished it and it coming out two days later, it was going to have to show up at someone's editorial cartoon in the newspaper or on the Daily Show or something. So you know, again, I breathed a sigh of relief. But you know, these, you know, it's nerve wracking. Let's talk about politics for a second, because the last couple of administrations has, have had to have been field days for you in terms of subjects and people that you can just have a great time with. Yeah, yeah, but, you know, I, I don't want it to be that obvious, like, you know, okay, Bush is a dummy or stuff, but I, I don't like to play that up. I mean, it's just too easy sometimes. So I, as, as long as they have uh, faces that are interesting to draw, like I love drawing Dick Cheney. I was going to say, exactly, even more so the, the, the soldiers for the men, I, not so much the presidents, but exactly like the Dick yeah, Cheney's, exactly. the Rumsfeld. Like, I, sort of, I, sort of, I miss Paul Wolfowitz. I could have put him in the Jewish comedian book. <laughs> <laughs> but Dick Cheney, I, I just love drawing Dick Cheney. He's like drawing a universal monster from the 1930s. <laughs> like, you know, he fits right into that mold. I especially love drawing him in black and or painting him in black and white for some reason. But uh, I just did a piece on him that, well, it, for the New Republic, it's about um, well, General Petraeus is about to come out with his Iraq report. Mm-hmm. So okay, so I have Dick Cheney and Connolly is right sitting there writing the report themselves and, and portray us sort of in the background like pushed aside like he's having nothing to do with it, you know, so. <laughs> and there's a balloon and stuff but that's about to come out so i just love you know whenever cheney pops up or, or bush you know really, to me you know george bush looks just like doodles weaver so that's always just been a treat for me to, <laughs> i pointed that out you know the separated the birth thing early on that you know oh my god he looks a little like jack gilford too but wow. weaver, he's a dead ringer for doodles weaver and Anybody doesn't know Doodles Weaver is you know was a comedian and was part of Spike Jones organization yeah, back he's... in the forties and he's Sigourney Weaver's uh, uncle and uh, Sigourney Weaver's father Pat Weaver was Doodles Weaver's brother. But, well, and Pat Weaver was the guy in charge of NBC. Yep, yep. Well, well if you want to, you know, just Google Doodles Weaver right now and you'll see what I mean. <laughs> Look, he's a dead ringer for George Bush. Yeah, yeah Doodles uh, Weaver is the guy who, who does the play-by-play on the horse race with Beetlebaum and, right, and, right, the, and the right, car race as well. Right, and, great recording. And he was, you know, with Spike, <laughs> Spike Jones for a while. And he did, like, a, people might remember him from the 60s. He did little short films, like, uh, on, that were on, like, uh, for kids, but they were silent films. They were like little silent films he did in the, in the 60s. They were great. Uh, so he looks, he's a dead ringer for George Bush. So if you don't take my word, just Google him right now. You'll see. Doodles Weaver. Uh, Do you have like stacks of DVDs? I mean, uh, you know, VHS was great in releasing so many like 
lost movies or obscure movies and things. And I mean, is, has has it gone on for you? I mean, are you just like hoarding DVDs and no, no, really. you, know, like, uh, you know, I haven't like gone the route of like of of, of getting rid of the C- the VHSs and replacing them with the DVDs. Oh, okay, so in a couple of cases, but uh, you know, I don't have that many. I have you know some favorite films of my wife and I's uh, are some of our favorite films and. Um, and TV shows like today, I just got somebody sent me two two volumes of Class Fifty Four. I'm all excited about that. Wow! Uh, I didn't know on DVD or on VHS. Uh, I think the, 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 my um, it was actually my brother-in-law sent. Um, t- he transferred uh, VHS to DVD on the Class Fifty Four. Oh, that's great! Yeah, so uh, they haven't been released yet. I'm waiting for those to come out on VH on, on DVD. Class Fifty Four, where are you? Which is one of my top three favorite shows, along with Bilko and the Honeymooners, I guess. But they haven't been released. They just came out with a big um, a Bilko celebration, you know, with about 30 episodes, but you know, not not near complete, but, you know, good enough. Has anyone ever approached you about doing commentaries and stuff? Because you are such a keeper of pop culture knowledge. Um, if, I, if I have, I, I'm not sure. I don't remember. No, not really, you know. Or uh, participation in any documentaries yeah, I, I, or anything? I did some commentary for, they, they released, uh, there was a documentary about Plan 9 from Outer Space a few years ago, and I did commentary on that. But, no, I haven't really been approached too much about w- with that stuff, you know, that I can recall. Maybe okay. I <laughs> well, I, I want to uh, wrap up and say uh, thank you. I, I enjoyed The Fun Never Stops. It's from Fantagraphic Books, as are uh, many of your uh, current books and, and previous books, so please check them out. They're very funny and, and always interesting, and I look forward to the second volume of, of More Jewish Comedians coming up uh, next year. Again, Drew, thanks thanks a lot for talking. It's, it's thanks, always John. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. So there you go, Drew Friedman. I suppose this is another episode of Weird Balloon. God, if anyone fits that description, it certainly is Drew Friedman's off-the-wall art and subjects and just point of view. I, I am such a fan of his stuff. And uh, honestly, I urge you to check out All the Presidents, a brand new collection from him from Fanographics. Um, they're very straight. I mean, they're really not... Uh, parodies per se and really his perception of what the various presidents looked like and honestly if you want to get a you know preview of it check out his YouTube video where he has a great conversation with uh, truly one of my uh, comedic idols Robert Klein at a Brooklyn bookstore and uh, they kind of notice how various presidents look and some of the uh, the uh, celebrities uh, old and new that uh, the presidents resemble but truly man it's so beautiful it literally looks like stuff, like I said, that could either be on money or on postage stamps, any official documents. I mean, really, uh, the Treasury ought to do themselves the favor or the Postal Service and commission Drew to uh, draw some stamps for them. Really neat stuff, and I'm such a fan of his work. I'm so happy to promote the new product and also remind everyone here at Word Balloon how great he is, and that's why I'm presenting these two old interviews with Drew. Drew Friedman on today's Word Balloon. I hope you enjoyed it. Today, brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners via Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash wordballoon if you'd like to subscribe to Word Balloon, but also uh, click on the ad at wordballoon.com, the Patreon ad, and that'll take you to my page. Thank you greatly for your support, League of Word Balloon listeners. Word Balloon also brought to you by Aftershock Comics. Uh, man, I'll tell you, if uh, Joe Pruitt and uh, Mike Martz are listening, I wouldn't mind if they uh, recruited Drew Friedman to do some comics for them. Uh, I'll tell you, uh, he would fit in with a lot of their off-the-wall thoughts on uh, books like Animosity from Marguerite Bennett and Shock from Joe Pruitt and many great creators that you will know immediately when you crack open that anthology. Also, uh, great stuff like uh, Chris, uh, Chris Abella doing a wonderful book and uh, I was going to say Colin Bunn uh, doing Night Temporal and Brothers Dracul and Stronghold from Phil Hester and Ryan Kelly and Dark Red from Tim Seeley, uh, Descendant from Stephanie Phillips. So many tremendous books that bear the Aftershock emblem on them. And they're worth your attention. Don't take my word for it. Go to their website. You'll find full story descriptions, preview pages, and the diamond codes on how to order their books through your local shop at aftershockcomics.com. Stick around because uh, in, in just a few minutes, within an hour or so, I'll be dropping the second Word Balloon podcast. Brian Bendis uh, had a big announcement in the New York Times confirming the rumors. Uh, we saw the preview cover for Superman 18 coming in December. It's official. Superman will be holding a uh, worldwide press conference in Superman 18, revealing himself to be Clark Kent. He's all about truth, justice, and the American way, except for the one, as Heath calls it, great lie about his identity. Uh, I was one among the people going, is this a good idea? 
when Brian first told me about it, literally, I'm like, you know, I'm your friend and I enjoy your stories. Is this a good idea? And it's something we discuss in the podcast. Um, he was kind enough to let me read 18 and 19 coming up. And uh, I haven't read 17 yet. Uh, That's obviously going to be coming out in November. But uh, I think Brian's done a great job on Superman. And I, and I, 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 you know, you all know, Brian obviously is my friend. I mean, I really think the Bendis Tapes is as much his podcast as it is my podcast. And I'm glad he treats it that way. Um, I can appreciate his argument. It all depends on the execution. Um, it sounds like he's had this well thought out, obviously. And uh, there are going to be reverberations across the DC Universe. Uh, it's easy to remember Spider-Man Civil War reveal. Um, and I think that was a missed opportunity. I think they put the genie in the bottle way too fast. And we got a couple of really cool stories out of it. But there should have been more. And it sounds like DC understands that. And uh, given some of their plans of where they're going generationally, this kind of makes sense that, no, this is the way Superman might be portrayed. After 80 years one way, maybe it's this kind of shakeup that will give us a whole bunch of new stories, not just for Superman, but how all the uh, heroes and villains perceive what's happening and what's to come. It does open up a lot of story possibilities. Brian and I discuss it on the next Word Balloon. I hope you'll join me for it. Until next time, thanks for listening. Word Balloon is a copyright feature of Shaky Productions, copyright 2019.